If you use something like the Solana VM where Neon EVM already exists, where they're working on Move VM by, uh, by code interpreters, we get to benefit from all this surrounding infrastructure uh, and we get all the benefits of the Solana VM, things like local fee markets, which all the rollups are going to need eventually. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Zero X Research. Today is May 8th, and we have an awesome interview lined up with Neil, the founder of Eclipse, a project enabling the deployment of customizable rollups. It's a really good interview, so be sure to stick around for that. But as always, we are joined by three members of the BlockWorks research team, Effort and Westy Capital and Ren. Dan is actually not feeling too hot today, so uh, we got an extra sub in from the research team. So so lucky for you guys. Uh, Effort, I'll pass it over to you for your hot seat or cool throne. Yeah, so I have um, <clears throat> two people on, or I guess two entities on uh, the cool throne this week, uh, putting Coinbase and myself on the cool throne. So I'll say myself first by saying uh, on the January 18th Blockworks Research, uh, Xerox Research podcast, I said, there's a really good chance, and these are quotes, there's a really good chance we see Coinbase go from cash flow negative to either neutral or positive by the end of the year. And they didn't necessarily go cash flow positive. They did lose $170 million. But this past week, uh, they announced their earnings for Q1 with a positive adjusted EBITDA of $284 million. They beat uh, Wall Street estimates, which had them doing about negative uh, 86 cent uh, earnings per share loss to a positive 45 cent earnings per share gain. They ended the quarter with 5.3 billion in cash. They uh, had a net revenue of 736 million, which was a beat of approximately 10 percent or so. Um, they had a huge increase in interest income because of uh, interest rate increases from the Fed. Although that there is some concerns that Q2 might be lower just because of the overall decrease in USDC supply. Um, we finally saw after like two rounds of cuts in 2022, we finally saw a headcount reduction of about a thousand employees. So you saw a massive decrease in overall OPEX. Uh, I think it's a really good story for Coinbase. This is still, despite like recent increases in prices this quarter, um, you're seeing them be cash flow neutral or positive. Uh, they're able to have this kind of business operation in the bottoms of a bear market. I can just imagine like how much they can churn profit in an upcoming bull. Um, on the news last week, Coinbase earnings, uh, after the Coinbase earnings announcement, they jumped like 20% on the stock. Overall, crypto markets are down today on May 8th. But if you actually look at Coin's stock today, they closed relatively flat. I don't, I really can't imagine there's much sellers at these levels considering the overall like sentiment uh, that Coin has right now. I love that you brought receipts. You know, you had the date of the podcast. So I got to respect it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with Coinbase, like I know in the past, they've said basically, in bear markets, they're ready to lose money and sort of make most of the money in the bull. Um, but it's good to see that even in a bear market now, they've uh, really focused on being cash flow positive and they've done a good job. So yeah, like super bullish Coinbase, love to see it. Yeah, a strong point. The Coinbase has been doing a lot of things in Q1. They acquired One River Asset Management and now they have their own asset management department. They launched Base their own L2, they launch an international exchange, and they also have Wallet as a service. So, you know, Coinbase is like all gears forward on basically everything. And part of the earnings call, a very strong emphasis of the earnings call was that they want to diversify their sources of revenue so that they make money in all market conditions. And I think sort of the steps that they've took has basically demonstrated that. And I listened to the earnings calls for Coinbase, a few interesting points. At the start of the earnings calls, Brian Armstrong first said that he had no intention to build a DEX on base. And I think a lot of people asked that given the sort of regulatory uncertainty, but actually towards the later end of the call, he said that as long as they're providing what customers want, there will be interesting opportunities to monetize on the DEX side as well. I'm not sure what specifically he meant by that, it could be maybe they'll partner with someone to build a DEX. Maybe they'll find a way to extract money out of the sequencer, but that's definitely something to look for going forward. And under the regulatory front, there's obviously that Wells notice from the SEC that came out around two months ago. They have that active sort of court case going where the SEC hasn't replied them. But actually, if you look at a lot of the data, Staking represents 3% of Coinbase's net revenue. BTC and ETH represents 56% of trading revenue. And I think it's relatively safe to say that those are not securities at this point. And almost 20% of their business is international. So even if the hammer really came down, it wouldn't be the end of the world. Sure, they would lose a huge amount of trading volume. Say all of the alts redeem securities, they would lose 44% of their trading volume. And those alts do probably have a higher trading spread 
in BTC and E, but definitely not the end of the world. So I think they're in a good spot. Yeah, I'm excited to see when Base actually launches on mainnet, if they kind of carry forward this narrative of mobile first, because obviously they have that app. And if you could actually use some of the dApps within the mobile uh, app or or mobile Coinbase wallet. I'm not even sure if they have a mobile Coinbase wallet. I'm a MetaMask user, but nonetheless, curious to see that effort. I think you were the first one to put themselves in the uh, the cool throne. So, so good on you. But I feel like you talk about Coinbase every other week. So I've got two questions for you. What do you think ETH does in price over the next bull run, like from you know peak to trough? And then what do you think about coin? That's a really good question. Um... I mean, hopefully in a bull market, ETH goes up. <laughs> hopefully, I mean, right now it's at what, $1,800 approximately today on May 8th. Um, I would have to assume that it does at least a 5X over the next cycle, ideally higher. Um, I think coin right now is at, what, a $10, $11 billion market cap. Uh, they made they were making upwards of $2 billion a quarter last cycle. Um, that's approximately, you know, a nine to $10 billion annual revenue. Um, I think they're a 10 X, honestly, a 10 to 15 X. I think they are going to be the higher beta play in the upcoming bull cycle. Assuming we have one. I personally think they are the best value play in crypto bar none. They have the users. They are legitimately like a legitimate business. Um, they're expanding their, their product suite, uh, into derivatives. They're growing internationally. When you have Aptos and Sui sitting at like 10 to $12 billion fully diluted mark cap, like would I rather have that or would I rather have Coinbase? Like, I think it's a no brainer. Um, I'm very long <laughs> coin, not financial advice, but I, I'm going to follow my fearless bald leader to the promised land. <laughs> I love to hear that. I guess I just struggle with if you're expecting a 5X out of ETH and that has to happen for Coinbase to do well, right? Like, let's just take it as it is. We need asset prices to go up in order for a Coinbase to ultimately succeed uh, over the long term. So I guess I just don't see the value in trying to go for a 10X over a 5X with all the regulatory risk that Coinbase faces. Like, I would absolutely hate myself if I balls long coin and, you know, there's a massive bull run and then all of Coinbase's businesses got taken out in the U.S. I just feel like that's somewhat of a risky play. I think that's fair. Um, it, it also is going to be dependent on like how tough regulatory, obviously the regulatory environment in, in Coinbase in the United States is. But one of the, like the, I want to say dark horses, but one of the things I'm going to be closely watching is how hard does the hand come down on Binance? Um, internationally, domestically here with their Binance U.S. operation, um, I think at the peak bull market valuations last year, oh, I'm sorry, two years ago, Binance was valued at like 300 plus billion dollars. Um, and I'm assuming if the next bull cycle, we see even higher all time highs, that could, if Coinbase gets a similar multiple or similar valuation to Binance last cycle, that's potentially a 30 X. I'm personally being conservative, I think in a 10 X, I could easily see 15, 20 to 30 X, which sounds crazy in a publicly traded market, but we know like how high beta, uh, uh, crypto is the regular stock market. Um, and I think coin is just going to be higher multiple to them. But I, I agree, Sam. I, I think regulatory environment is like a huge risk. Uh, but I'd also imagine that if Coinbase had like a really big regulatory crackdown on them, that the rest of the crypto ecosystem would suffer um, just because of how much institutional volume alone Coinbase has. They have like top, I think they have the 25 largest um institutional funds like in the world using their platform. I'm sure there's institutions using Binance as well, but a heavy majority of like, I think future uh, net demand is going to come from like the US side, assuming regulations are clear. Yeah, that's fair. Strong agree there. Crypto definitely would struggle if Coinbase got, you know, taken out of the US. So uh, anyways, Ren, who you got in the hot seat of Cool Throne? Yeah, I got Lido Dow in the hot seat this week. So around one month ago, SushiSwap got exported for around 1800 WEF. That was a result of them upgrading to their V3 or more accurately utilizing the Uni V3 contracts to upgrade their protocol. As a result of the hack, the exporter paid around an 800 ETH bribe to the validator in order to get his block included. That validator was run by one of the Lido validators and 90% of that bribe got sent to the protocol. So whoever had ETH stake, they get like a pro rata share of it. 5% of that got sent to the node operator and 5% of that got sent to the DAO treasury. So that's roughly 40 ETH. 
And basically, someone at Sushi Shop has went to the Lido forum and say, hey, can we have our 40 ETH back? And the vote's going on right now. Right now, the Lido DAO is voting, no, we're not giving you the 40 ETH back. And that basically sets an interesting precedent for sort of MEV validators and exploits going forward. More specifically, is a validator or is a liquid staking protocol sort of operator on the hook for any exploited funds? My personal bias is no, it should be purely up to the protocol to go seek the exploiter and ask him for the funds that he got away. The way I see the MEV bribe is that it's an additional cost of capital that should be borne by the exporter. That's money that he spent and he probably would have spent either way, maybe even if his like transactions didn't go through, right? Just because he wanted his block included so badly. And so that's a cost that should be borne to him. Um, but yeah, it's just interesting to see how this will potentially set a precedent. And I think one thing is that the DAO here does not want to act as an arbitrator between the exploited protocol and the validator, right? Sure, the validators run the validator for Lido, but I think in this case, Lido DAO is going to say, hey, no, we don't want to like be the middleman in the conversation. Just go talk to the validator, find him yourself. Yeah, this is definitely a super interesting governance vote. I know the team at Sushi seemed pretty confident when this first went down that they'd be able to extract some of that uh, ETH back from Lido, but it looks like the vote is going uh, the other way, which again, I would agree with you, Ren, that that's probably the better decision because... As soon as you say yes to this, then it sets a weird precedent going forward, not only for Lido, but for other staking, liquid staking protocols, as well as just individual validators that are doxxed. I think, you know, it could potentially cause a lot of issues down the road. And I wonder if something like this brings more credence to something like ETH burn for MEV, or rather than it going to like an entity that's known and someone saying, hey, can I have my funds back. Instead, it allows the network to be completely neutral um, and not necessarily pick an individual that could or could not be liable um, either like individually or maybe even at a legal level. So yeah, I wonder how the conversation goes from here on ETH burn. Yeah, definitely agree with both your takes too. Like I don't think the DAO or the validator who got lucky enough to mine that block should be obligated to you know, return the funds to the exploited protocol. That sets a very dangerous precedent, precedent in my opinion. Um, I did want to take a second this episode uh, to call out GovHub, our new governance product. Um, we just launched it last week. It is an incredible product. It's basically something that tracks uh, governance proposals from the very early ideation phase, like when the conversations are happening on Telegram, Discord, etc., through the forum, through the actual snapshot vote and when it gets implemented. Uh, we, we personally think, just as people who are in this stuff every single day, it's incredibly hard to track even when you have a full team of people doing it like all day, every day. So we wanted to surface all the information that we've been gathering and be sure to return that to our subscribers. So if you haven't checked that out at blockworksresearch.com, be sure to, and I am very confident you will find it as useful as we do. But uh, Westy, what you got on the cool, hot seat or cool throne? Yeah, it's somewhat related, but on the cool throne, I actually have ETH. Um, both as staking ETH as well as ETH as the asset. Um, so yeah, like meme coins and speculation of uh, the past couple of weeks have been bumping up the staking rate, um, both as a result of increased gas fees as well as just MEV from bots like Jared from Subway.eth um, racking up that MEV. Um, so right now I think Lido's quoting 6.6 .6 APR and I can imagine uh, other liquid staking providers like Frax are quoting even more which I think was up from 5% a couple of weeks ago, uh, which is just, I mean, incredible as like a risk-free rate within DeFi. Um, and then beyond just the staking rate, the burn itself is incredible. Like if you pull up ultrasound.money, it's quoting like a, a negative 2.7% inflation rate for ETH, which is just mind blowing. Um, and then when it comes to ETH staking as a whole, yesterday we actually saw the, the exit queue zero out and the entry queue is around 28,000 validators, which would take roughly 15, 16 days to get through. Um, and so we're going to see the ETH staking rate start to climb uh, over time as like the exit queue stays at a pretty minimal level and the entry queue keeps growing. Um, and yeah, we saw like uh, a lot of fighting on the timeline yesterday when it came to like ETH fees being too high and whether that's good from an overall design or adoption standpoint. All I know is that whenever this conversation comes up on my timeline, it's because 
something is happening where users are paying willingly paying the fees to use the chain. Um, and so, yeah, it's been an interesting week and really good for uh, ETH holders as a whole. When you said ETH was on the cool throne for a second, I was going to say in this market, because the chart's not looking too good today. But uh, Wesley, I'm curious what your thoughts are with Celsius. I know, I think like through their liquidation process, they have like a decent amount of staked ETH through, through Lido. So when those withdrawal queues open up for them, I'd have to imagine like that could potentially create like a couple billion dollars in sell pressure, which is, I part of me feels like what you're seeing in the market right now, like this risk off going into uh, Lido opening up the, the withdrawal queue. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, we don't know exactly when they're going to withdraw and how they're going to liquidate the assets. I don't believe it's a billion dollars. I believe it's much less than that. So I don't think it's a, it's a huge overhang on the market. But at the same time, like obviously, um, because Celsius does need to liquidate their holdings, that is like automatic sell pressure. And there's probably, like I said in, in a previous episode, when it comes to like the exit queue, we're going to see sort of waves as they're like specific events. And I think Celsius is one of those events. We also have uh, Lido enabling withdrawals in a few days, and that could ten- potentially be another event, although I don't think it's going to be that big a- of an event because I think they'll have enough ETH sort of in their buffer to handle short-term withdrawals, so I think they'll be okay. Um, but yeah, Celsius is definitely like the biggest overhang when it comes to withdrawals, and once we see that go through, I don't really think there's much on that end. Wesley, I think you brought up a very great point, right? There's like a lot of salty individuals on the timeline saying, you know, this is not the future of blockchain. This is unusable for like the normie. But the fact is gas fees are so high because people are using ETH. If not, it wouldn't be so high, right? Sure, maybe speculation on Pepe and other meme tokens isn't the most valuable use case and not exactly where we hope the industry would be after 10 years of hard work. But... I mean, it shows that block space and like the demand for the block space is still there, right? And it shows that there is like a sustainable model, assuming you don't like infinitely scale block space and validated requirements for blockchain networks out there. And that there is a portion of this that will be solved in the future, you know, as like EIP4884, I'm getting the numbers confused now, um, but all those scaling solutions start getting rolled out. Like these are problems that will have solutions. And eventually when we reach the next cycle you know where new actually new participants come into the market not existing participants who rejoin the market come in they may for example onboard straight to an l2 without ever going to an l1 and at that point maybe that's where the capital is and all of the speculative activity i'm hoping just this but maybe by that time all of the speculative activity will be taking place on l2s rather than l1 but the reason why a lot of this is still happening today on l1s is because the network effects are there the money's there, the liquidity's there. And so if you want to create a really big meme token, you're going to launch it on ETHL1. Is there any kind of metric you can look at, Westy, do you think that kind of indicates people's confidence in the, I guess, the event going into Lido enabling withdrawals? Like I was thinking maybe the ETH to ETH peg, but even that doesn't really feel like it'd be a, a great metric to look at. Do you have any ideas there? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I don't know if there's any like good metric to look at. I do think the Steeth peg is an interesting one, although I'm not sure it's perfect because let's say Steeth is, is trading like below an ETH peg that actually gives credence to people to withdraw from Lido because you can arbitrage that peg. Um, and so if anything, like I think it's probably the best metric to know like where it's trading, to know like the general confidence in STETH going forward. But in terms of like, trading the withdrawal event itself i think eth might be just the best proxy because people think they're withdrawing to then sell that eth but overall there isn't like a a best metric do you think lido's market share goes up post withdrawals or or goes down and flocks to rocket pool frax eth coin i mean probably not coinbase eth but um other competitors yeah it's tough to to maintain the market share that they have so I think just based off of that and based off of other derivatives offering higher yield uh, with things like Frax, for example, I do think they'll lose a bit of market share. But at the same time, SDE has a lot more like uh, market share and like network effects within DeFi with things such as like Aave's like leverage looping um, staking over there, which I think is a big contributor to the supply, as well as just like using SDETH as collateral in other places such as Maker, et cetera. 
I think it's definitely the most established. And so I could see it maintaining market share, but at the same time, I think it's pretty ripe for uh, another competitor to come in and uh, steal a bit. I think one thing that the market doesn't even include, uh, last thing about Lido, is the, a lot of their Genesis validators are like large infrastructure providers outside of the Ethereum ecosystem. So like P2P is, I believe, like the founder or the Genesis founder of Lido. They run a majority of the infrastructure. Uh, I'm sorry, they run infrastructure for a majority of the Cosmos chains, for example. I think they're large validators in Solana. So I think the market typically, obviously, because all the liquidity and all the economy is really on Ethereum. But it, once Lido or Lido starts going to other ecosystems and start providing staked Solana, uh, liquid staking, staked Atom, um, et cetera, et cetera, like you can easily see Lido's market dominance, like as a whole, not just the Ethereum, like continue to go up. And I just feel like that's like a blind spot for a lot of crypto Twitter and a lot of people that are just solely focused on on the Ethereum ecosystem, like Lido's market share or overall like assets staked under under management can just go parabolic um, as these other ecosystems grow. Effort, do projects in the Cosmos ecosystem typically count um, staked supply in the circulating supply? And the reason I ask is just you don't see many people talking about the like amount of staked ETH going up um, at the same time as the burn. Like, so if you actually didn't include that in the, the ETH circulating supply, like that would paint an even more bullish picture. And, you know, you could even argue if the entry queue gets pretty long, it's even longer than Cosmos is a uh, 21 day unbonding period. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, one of the, the Cosmos ecosystem has like the exact opposite issue that I think Ethereum has where, um, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I think like 12 to 13th percent of the entire supply stake today for Ethereum. Um, maybe somewhere higher teens today, but like Cosmos ecosystem has the exact opposite where overwhelming majority of the supply is staked, 66, 67%. I actually think today in for Cosmos Hub specifically, uh, around 70% of the entire supply is staked. Um, and there's like a whole issue with having that, that staked supply actually be used in the DeFi ecosystem. So there's like some really interesting developments in liquid staking solutions in the Cosmos side, uh, Stride being like the major provider there. But uh, to, to answer your question, Sam, um, they can, they still consider like the stake supply still being part of circulating market cap, even though there's like a 21 to 28 day unbonding period uh, for those assets to become liquid. Um, but unfortunately, it really hasn't changed most of the price action because most Cosmos assets have been down only probably because of the high inflationary staking rewards. Uh, but I think liquid staking is going to make a huge unlock for Cosmos DeFi. And I'm really excited to see that uh, unfold over the coming quarters. Gotcha. Well, along the same lines of high transaction fees, I've got Bitcoin maxis in the hot seat. Uh, Bitcoin is like widely known to have a, a long term security problem. Like the block subsidy is going to decline. You've got to make up that that delta to some degree with transaction fees to go out to revenues or miners. Um, so BRC 20s are this new thing. It's basically a super inefficient token standard built on top of the ordinal theory. And Chainlink God actually made a really good comparison here on Twitter saying that it's kind of like if every time you transferred an Ethereum ERC-20, it was like you had to mint an NFT right alongside with it. Um, and then these uh, account balances actually need to be indexed off chain in order to figure out, you know, who owns what uh, in terms of the ERC-20 balances or BRC-20 balances. Um, so super inefficient, honestly, but uh, it's giving Bitcoiners the ability to speculate on meme coins because uh, apparently they're jealous of the Pepe millionaires that have been minted over the past few weeks. Unisat is the name of the marketplace that people go to to trade these things. Um, but you either need to have had 20 transactions on Unisat, I believe, on Unisat in order to be able to trade these things, or you need to have held a pass from the marketplace for 500 block confirmation. So that's like, I don't know, two, three, four days, probably way longer than that with how long block times are right now. Um, but uh, but yeah, so Bitcoin miner revenue last week was actually composed 15% of transaction fees and ordinal mints. So that's like the, the highest ratio that's been since April, 2021, which is pretty wild to think about that it's been over two years since we've seen minor revenue composed of transaction fees this heavily. I would tell people definitely uh, be careful with this one, honestly. Um, it's super liquid. There's long block times on Bitcoin. Uh, it could end up in a really painful crash because right now everyone's just trying to get in. So there's like 20 mints and like everyone's trying to buy these things. And who knows what the unwind looks like, especially if transaction fees get super high and the network's really congested. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess people are talking about 
is there a way we can internalize this this transaction fee revenue to Bitcoin holders? But, you know, that's how proof of stake works. And I'm pretty sure Westy has some thoughts on that. Uh, but, yeah, I would just say definitely don't go uh, all in on this one. And I guess just one other question I have is if you're a miner and you're seeing transaction rewards in a block be equal to the block subsidy, why would you ever want to give that back? Like, wouldn't you be incentivized to kind of almost DDoS the network and keep transaction fees super high? Like, I don't know. This just has some crazy implications for Bitcoin. And it's definitely the most exciting thing that's occurred over there in quite some time. Yeah, I think a lot of the conversations on Twitter have been super interesting. I mean, you have your Bitcoin maxis that think this is like a DDoS attack and that like Bitcoin should just like not accept these transactions. Um, which is pretty ridiculous because, you know, they've been fighting for Bitcoin adoption for years. And finally, when it's adopted for something, all of a sudden they're against it, which I think is pretty funny. And then, Sam, yeah, you mentioned there was conversation around like giving these fees to Bitcoin holders somehow, which uh, I'm not sure if that makes sense because you need these like, this revenue in order to pay miners, especially as the, the block subsidy falls. Um, and I, Nick Carter said something interesting where maybe there's some sort of like minimum subsidy or minimum like fees needed to actually keep the network going. And then like whatever's on top of that can go to holders somehow, which I think is an interesting conversation, but it becomes a lot tougher under proof of work because a lot of those fees are needed to incentivize these miners to, to keep doing their job. And so I like jokingly tweeted on Twitter, you know, that there is another consensus mechanism where token holders do provide the security and I think it can help a lot, but I don't see Bitcoin going to prove a stake anytime soon. Um, but yeah, just wanted to bring that up as well. I think a really interesting play, if you don't want to buy an ordinal, uh, you don't want to buy a BRC20, the barriers of entry are way too high. Like Sam said, like so many people are rushing in. You don't know if the rug is going to get pulled out from under you. Um, but I'm going to quote myself for hopefully like a future episode. But I think it's a really interesting play to long publicly traded crypto miners. Uh, it's probably the easiest job on Wall Street to become a TradFi analyst just following Bitcoin miners because you literally just have to know what is the block subsidy, what percentage hash rate uh, do they have. And it really and they, the miners already give you like a good idea of like how many additional uh, hash rate they think they're going to have like in coming quarters. Really simple math to do this, but there's no way any Wall Street analyst knows what the hell a BRC20 is. And to Sam's point before. Over the weekend, we saw transaction fees go above or equal to uh, the block subsidy for a whole day. If this trajectory continues, if we see a full month to two months of ordinals and transaction fees on Bitcoin continuing at this rate, um, I guarantee you that Wall Street's not going to really understand to know that like miners are actually having a, a large increase in revenue over time. And we can see some of these publicly traded miners seriously beat estimates. Um, I just think it's a really interesting play. I'm going to look at it. Uh, again, not financial advice. I'm personally not in any publicly traded miner today, but it's something I'm going to be following. So if this, can, this uh, trend continues, it, it could be a really interesting play for the coming quarters. Yeah, I definitely agree with every capital here. I mean, if you think about it, Pepe has almost been out for one month and sure, maybe he has like kind of topped in some sense. I hope so for my mental health. Um, but either way, I definitely still think it has legs to go, right? And on another front, like, Sure, speculative activity could be a way to solve like Bitcoin security budget issues, but speculative activity always dies at some point, you know, or at least it comes in like peaks and troughs. You you don't want like a security budget that's unsustainable for like three months and it works for three months. That's not exactly very secure, so to say. And I would also say the Bitcoin network isn't that functional right now, right? There's 500,000 unconfirmed transactions in the mempool. That's almost double the previous all-time high that occurred in 2017. Um, if you work out the math, Bitcoin processes an average of 3.1 transactions per second. So it'll take 44 hours just for all of the unconfirmed transactions in the mempool to clear right now, if no new transactions come in, which is obviously not possible given all of the speculative activity happening right now. So yeah, but definitely something to pay attention to. Yeah, the minor play is a right curve play that I actually feel like will work. <laughs> so I love that call. And I, I think in three months time after Q2 earnings, you'll be back on the cool, cool throne uh, effort. But I guess I also find it interesting that people in the Bitcoin camp always point to proof of stake is like, okay, the rich get richer. This is kind of the same dynamic if it persists, because 
you're basically transferring value from users uh, transacting on the network to the miners. So um, it'll be interesting to watch just all this play out. I don't know. Fascinating times for Bitcoin, for sure. I think that's a good place to call it, though. Thanks for coming on, guys. Uh, over to the interview with Neil from Eclipse. All right. We are here for the interview with Neil, the co-founder or founder. Actually, maybe, Neil, you can specify that for me <laughs> once I end it over to you of Eclipse. Um, it's great to have you on, Neil. Hey, uh, great to meet you guys. All right. So I actually was listening to a podcast that you had like four months ago, and I did not know, but apparently you were building an EVM type solution on Terra uh, in March. That's when you left your TradFi job. And then obviously Terra imploded uh, two months after. So I was just kind of curious. I needed to get your take. Why did you decide to build in the Terra ecosystem? Why EVM? And then also, um, what were the thoughts going through your head? Were you just like, man, I just left a great job. Like, why did I do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a while ago, so I have to think back a little bit. But I think the biggest reason why I was interested in Terra was honestly traction. It was growing really quickly. The UST was ripping. Uh, there was a lot of interest in it. And I was just thinking about all the interesting DeFi primitives you could build on top of that. So I wrote some blog posts talking about interest rate swaps and a bunch of stuff using UST. And then I thought I had a power background. I was a quant at Citadel at the time uh, doing power and gas. And I thought this could be interesting because uh, Bitcoin mining, and I think it's probably long enough after my time at Citadel where I can say this, but it was like actually impacting the demand side in some regions. That's something that was actually meaningful to model. So I was like, okay, now this represents an opportunity cost over batteries. And some of these power plants like Brandon Shores were actually ripping out power plants and sticking uh, Bitcoin rigs in their place. Uh, when it economically made sense to do so. So I thought that was interesting. And I thought, well, now they're being exposed to the wholesale price of electricity, the price of Bitcoin, the difficulty. This is something that you'd want to have some native on-chain hedging for. So that was an initial motivation too. Uh, but yeah, I left uh, Terra Depag very shortly after. So I didn't spend too much time there. The reasoning behind why bring EVM compatibility to it was really just that there's a ton of UST. I felt like it was like dry powder. Uh, that just needed some use case as the anchor yields went down because I think that they had recently implemented the dynamic rate for yield for anchor. And I, I'm I'm gonna just assume that the audience just already knows like the history of Terra and stuff, so not worth going into. Uh, but uh, yeah, that was my reasoning. I was like, let's basically we need some uncorrelated sources of demand, which could come from some of these Ethereum DApps or some of these DApps that are going multi-chain. Of course, my thesis changed pretty substantially when Terra depagged. Even my thesis on EVM compatibility and the, what it does for an ecosystem. Uh, kind of changed in the sense that, and this is something that people warned me of when I was building the Terra EVM, but they were like, you know, EVM compatibility brings a lot of really low quality applications. It, there's a lot of forks and sometimes these forks end up being very successful like Sushi Swap, but a lot of the time they don't. And they're very, just, there's, there, there's no actual PMF and there's no reason why that app would succeed in one ecosystem versus another. And it's just, it's something that doesn't really exist in other industries outside of crypto. But here in crypto, we're like, let's just take an idea and put it just regionally very nearby and see if it rips there, even if it didn't work in the first place. And I, I think that's kind of a broken approach to product uh, strategy and product development. So that's how my thoughts on EVM compatibility changed. Although I think it's a great go-to-market tactic and I think it's great for portability. A lot of those reasons still apply. It's like the React native of crypto. You write one place and you get to deploy everywhere. But th my question is just like, why do you want to deploy everywhere? Is that something that's like, are you trying to access more users? And if that's the case, is it because you've completely saturated the blockchain that you're deployed to? Uh, and if, if you haven't saturated the blockchain you're deployed to, then maybe there's actually some more product work you need to be doing rather than just like blindly deploying to other ecosystems. So given that you're building Eclipse, I, I have a, a decent idea of what your answer to this question is going to be. But over the last seven or eight episodes of Zero X Research, we've really been diving into these different theses of what blockchain evolution will look like over the next couple of years. Uh, you know, the idea of app chains or uh, the more modular view of the world or even just like the high throughput monolithic giants. Um, and so I want to get your take on all that. What do you think is the most dominant form of blockchain if you zoom out uh, even just the next couple of years? Yeah, so the one thing that the monoliths have right now is network effects. They have a lot of liquidity on these chains. There's developers who already write for those platforms and they identify with the brand. I think that a lot of that liquidity has left some ecosystems. Like if you look at Solana, it's nothing compared to what it looked like during a bull market. Uh, of course, if you accurately measured what was the TVL during the bull market, maybe it, it actually is a little more commensurate, but <clears throat> that's the advantage. The, the disadvantage is that there aren't many reasons why a new chain would choose to be a monolith over being a roll-up 
assuming that the roll-up tech is fully built. Given that the roll-up tech is not as fully developed as like Cosmos SDK, and that's hard for me to say because it's like I think we've been do we have like very cool tech right now and get way higher throughput than what you'd get with any existing roll-up, blah blah blah. But the roll up, there's things like sequencing, for example, which I was talking to you guys a little bit before this call. I thought Josh Bowen's episode was awesome. I think the future of sequencers is something that I'm really curious about and that I'm still putting together our thesis on. But as far as the rest of crypto, I think that what we'll see is a lot of these apps that don't really need crazy customization, stuff like AMMs, which are actually adapted to chains in many ways. Like an AMM probably existed on Ethereum largely because it's too expensive to have an order book. So these apps that have already adapted to existing traditional chains can probably stay where they are or maybe move to a shared roll-up. But apps that are really pushing the frontier, which is what I'm hoping to see in this next wave, consumer apps like gaming, fully on-chain games, uh, things that are, and fully on-chain games is a topic of its own, and I don't want to open up a can of worms there, but phys physical infrastructure networks, I think are really interesting for Eclipse, and we have a handful of those deployed. Uh, these are the apps that I think will need customizations at the execution layer and they're much better off having their own chain. L1s are hard to deploy. It's very expensive. It's cumbersome. Need a reliability team. So by deploying a roll-up, they can avoid a lot of those pitfalls. Awesome. That's a, a great intro into your kind of broader thesis. I'm sure we're going to touch on a lot of those things you mentioned pretty deeply in this, in this episode. Um, but I guess, can we just start by providing a high-level overview of what Eclipse is and it, exactly the problem it's aiming to solve? Yeah. Uh, so the context is that, uh, I mean, this is, just historical context that many viewers are probably aware of, but Ethereum gas fees were historically very high, and there have been many attempts to solve for that. So there was Polygon POS and Binance Smart Chain, which were essentially EVM compatible forks. And uh, that, I think it's a large reason why they precipitously took off because it was just timing and it was that time of day where there was really no alternative to the ETH L1 if you had EVM compatible code. Of course, I mean, EVM, having alt EVM chains was in the spec so early. If you go like EIP-155, I think it's where chain ID is introduced. And it's, it's not something that's like that novel of an idea, but this was the initial scaling solution. And you had uh, fast all, all ones like Solana. And then there's the alternate vision, which is the roll-up centric roadmap, like Arbitrum, Optimism. And these are all basically solving the problem of limited block space, uh, solving for high gas fees. And, and, then, and then along with that first vision with all L1s is like the cosmos centric vision app chains where they never really took off precipitously where we have thousands of app chains that are actively being used. And there are folks that are working on solutions to make it very easy to deploy a cosmos L1 right now. But there, there's not really any stickiness there because what, what I realize or what, what I think a lot of people realize is that the value of having a cosmos L1 isn't really about lower gas fees. Because there are other L1s like Solana or something that give you low gas fees. It's actually more about the customizability that having an app chain gives you. So that's the benefit that we kind of like naturally uncovered about app chains. And that's why the whole like Cosmos, ABCI division between consensus and application layer is so great. Because you can customize the application layer, but not worry about the messy internals of consensus, such as what Helium had to do for their L1, which was developed before Cosmos SDK even existed. So, uh, so that's that's the full context on what existed before and where the benefits of different ecosystems lie. Like Cosmos, you get customizability. Solana and these alt L ones, you get low gas fees, and then the roll ups get the benefit of sharing the security of Ethereum. So Eclipse is basically taking those core properties and letting you pick and choose and say, I want really low fees, but I also want to be in the Ethereum ecosystem. Or maybe I want to be in the Cosmos ecosystem and I'm okay with a beefier execution node. I just want as much throughput as possible. So we're, we allow people to make those trade-offs by dividing up these different concepts or properties of a blockchain into these modules in the same vision as Celestia. And actually Nick White at Celestia was the first person that reached out to me when Terra Deepak. He said, hey man, sorry to hear about that. Let's, let's do something else. Uh, and he was really great at explaining the Celestia vision of the future which is basically a blockchain has a few properties. One is that it has to execute transactions. So it has to compute state transitions. It takes in transactions. Second, it has to uh, establish the ordering of those transactions and make them available to everyone in the network so that everyone can independently verify, okay, this is indeed the end result of executing some block of transactions. That's consensus and data availability. And then the last step is verifying that those state transitions were actually executed correctly. And that's settlement. And that's really only a thing for rollups. So Eclipse just takes those three concepts and separates them very cleanly 
So we let you deploy some customized execution chain, whether it's EVM, SVM, some other virtual machine down the line. You get to pick your consensus in DA layer. That could be Ethereum if you're down to pay the price. It's probably not a great solution right now. And actually, our block time is so short that it's, it's basically prohibitively expensive. Uh, you could use Celestia, EigenDA, Avail, <coughs> BNB chain. We're using the Greenfield solution. So sometimes customers will request something special. Like for Injective, they want to use a centralized DA to start until Celestia is live. So you can customize the DA layer. And then you build in those additional customizations on top of the execution layer to facilitate whatever kind of application you're building. Maybe you're a game and you need VRFs, you need verifiable random functions. Maybe you're like a, um, like you're doing an NFT mint and you don't want to charge gas. Now you can make it gasless. Maybe you want to do something special in the mempool, like redistribute MEV. These are all options available to you when you have your own chain. Awesome. That's a great background there. And I want to dive a little deeper into the actual architecture, right? So Eclipse itself is just this settlement layer, and then essentially rollups will plug into this, and then they have the ability to now choose uh, where they're settling down to through their DA layer. Um, and you mentioned that you were kind of going to provide all these options through Ethereum or Celestia, Polygon Avail. Um, is that going to be something that's available at launch, or is that uh, something that you're kind of like a, more of a vision you're building into? So our chains are all over the place right now. We have probably 10 chains on Celestia. We have a handful on EigenDA. And some of the ones that really want to expedite their mainnets are using centralized DA, which is a solution that we just built in-house, basically posed to like the Google Cloud equivalent of an S3 bucket, like Google Cloud Storage or something. That's where the blocks are stored for them. So that feature is already ready. Uh, and then as far as the execution layer customizations, those are things that for gaming, we've pretty much developed the ICP or the ideal customer profile. For other verticals like DeFi, for example, we're coming up with these novel constructions and seeing, because we haven't really expanded into DeFi and we've deliberately avoided it just because there's so much surrounding infrastructure that's needed. They have issues around liquidity fragmentation and you have to really make sure you're solving a real problem for them before you try to scale a strategy like that. So we've been putting together a couple of novel constructions, which I probably shouldn't share on the call because they're not ready yet, but uh, we're working with a couple of design partners on that to see if, uh, if there's PMF there. Hey, feel free to leak that. We, we love the good, uh, the good alpha leaks. <laughs> um, but uh, at fear of this being a bad analogy, please let me know. But is it fair to make a general assumption or a parallel to essentially Eclipse being similar to like Arbitrum 1 in that L3s can plug into Arbitrum L1 and that will settle down to Ethereum, whereas Rollups can plug into uh, Eclipse and then settle down to an L1 of their choice? The thing is that like for our rollups, you have to, it has to be an Eclipse rollup that plugs into our settlement layer. And theoretically, you could probably force OP stack to somehow use our settlement layer. But the assumption is that we're, it's also an Eclipse chain that's, uh, that's executing as the L3. So, and I, I hate the terminology L3, L2. I just use it just because it's simple. But um, so basically, we're providing an honest minority settlement layer. So it's a settlement layer that basically adds very few, if not like no additional trust assumptions, depending on how you frame it. There's never really no trust assumptions, but uh, we're adding minimal trust assumptions at the settlement piece. We let you pick your L1, and then we also have a specific execution layer, which will let you deploy. We could run it for you, which is what we're doing right now for all the chains, or in the future, we'll possibly use some shared sequencer network, might have a sequencer fee market. There, there, there are different ways that we could do this. And now, am I right in my understanding that the settlement layer is an optimistic design? And if so, how do you plan on incentivizing people to submit fraud proofs in, in the case of an invalid uh, transaction? Yeah, so right now, all the Eclipse chains are optimistic rollups. Uh, in the future, we have this ZK proof of concept, which is like a, so the Solana VM is, it's a Berkeley packet filter virtual machine. So, uh, I mean, your processor on a computer doesn't have like a BPF bytecode interpreter. So typically you, you take that, compile it to like, uh, I don't know, like x86 or something. So we change that. Uh, there's some existing uh, library called Solana RBPF. We output risk five bytecode instead. And uh, we add in some memory packaging and we use risk zero, which is a zero knowledge risk five VM. And that's how we do the ZK settlement. And that's still in development. That'll be probably the right, the right choice for the majority of Eclipse chains. So there's some arguments to be made that some of the chains should remain optimistic. As far as incentivizing people to verify or to submit fault proofs, the plan is basically that it should be the, um, the people who uh, want the chain to work correctly. So if you're an app, if you're a game or something, and you're, you're a player that's playing Worlds, for example, which is a fully on-chain game with Eclipse, then if you really want your money, if you want to have that confidence that your money is being handled properly, then you would run the, um, you would actually run a node yourself. And what do those node requirements look like? 
So right now we haven't optimized it at all. It's about two grand a month without any like additional cost cutting. We've been told that we probably get it on the order of hundreds or something. It's not something that's been a priority for us right now, but uh, but yeah, it's it's uh, at the max it'll be two grand. Let's say two grand a month. Right. Okay. And so, kind of taking a step back and going into more of the architecture side of the th- side of it. So, how does the settlement layer communicate to the DA layer? Right. So, let's say uh, you know I'm a I'm a roll up an eclipse roll up and I want to settle down to Celestia. So, I would speak to the settlement layer, but but how does that message get passed back to Celestia? Yeah, the nodes in the settlement layer run light clients for Celestia. So they'll post to that light client. It'll post it to Celestia. And then as far as if you're, so this is the weird part, but the settlement layer itself, the way that it's an honest minority is it is also a rollup. So our, so an Eclipse L3 is a smart contract rollup on the Eclipse L2, which is a sovereign rollup. So this thing doesn't settle to like Ethereum or something. Instead, it passes fault proofs or validity proofs directly to light clients. And that's, that's how the Eclipse L2 works. So this way it's like honest minority all the way down until you hit the L1, at which point, obviously, if the L1 gets reorged, then then that would uh, impact your rollup. Can you dive into like kind of the meaning of an honest minority? Like what does that actually mean in, in relation to like, you know, in, in contrast to Ethereum, let's say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like if you look at uh, a consensus like Tendermint or something, if you have 33% of the chain that's honest, then you're guaranteed that no incorrect like behavior is going to occur. If you have 66%, then you're guaranteed liveness. So 66% is the honest majority assumption. It's that you need most of the chain to be honest for this chain to continue in order for to enforce correctness. Whereas an honest minority assumption is less than that. It's just, you don't need everyone to be honest. You just need to be well peered. You need to be connected to someone who's honest. And that honest person will tell you the truth. And the weakest honest minority assumption would be one event. So that's like, if you have a smart contract roll up, like Arbitrum on Ethereum, Assuming they enabled fault proofs and they they decentralize the verifier, anyone it just takes one honest person in the in the entire world. You don't even have to know, know who they are. You don't have to connect to them. But this assumption of being well peered is that's a pretty reasonable one because if you think about it, even a full node on Ethereum must be well peered in order to understand to get what's the correct state of the network. You have to talk to some honest full node. They have to give you the the blocks, and that's that's like a necessary condition of being a part of the network. Otherwise, you're essentially being eclipse attacked. Got it. Got it. So the SVM, why did you choose the SVM and what are like the distinct advantages that it provides uh, Eclipse? That was, that's been such a discussion with so many people. Like it's because uh, it, basically we wanted to provide multiple bytecodes. So we wanted to make it so if you want to use EVM bytecode, move, uh, SVM, something else, then that's all available to you. So there's different ways we could have approached it. One is maybe just fork OP stack and re-implement the interactive fault prover with uh, different bytecodes or something, different virtual machines. That seemed very manual and cumbersome. And it also meant that all we have is a bytecode interpreter at that point, but we lose all the ben- the surrounding benefits of the Solana VM, meaning you lose parallelism, you lose the local fee markets, you lose like <clears throat> any additional advances they make. We have to maintain parity, which is just like a, a pain. Like we don't want to keep constantly be checking like, oh, Solana added a new system program. Now we have to implement that. Uh, so that, those are reasons why we didn't want to do that. Another option is something similar to ZK Sync. Maybe you compile everything to some like LLVM intermediate representation, convert that to some bespoke bytecode, which is specific to Eclipse. Uh, but if you look at like ZK Sync, they spent a long time trying to implement, for example, Yule. Yule is a language that not too many people use. And it's a huge accomplishment for them. It takes a lot of effort, but it's not, it's like incrementally you still don't get very much from that effort that you're putting in. The marginal reward for each additional language seemed very low. Whereas if you use something like the Solana VM where Neon EVM already exists, where they're working on Move VM by, uh, by code interpreters, we get to benefit from all this surrounding infrastructure uh, and we get all the benefits of the Solana VM. Things like local fee markets, which all the rollups are going to need eventually. Things like parallelism, which is necessary for high throughput. Things like uh, Seahorse Lang lets you write Python programs and run it on the Solana VM. So we wanted all of that. And that was the reason why we picked the Solana VM. And it also allows us to bring the SVM to other ecosystems, such as what we've done for Injective, Polygon, Near, uh, some of these other ecosystems which haven't been announced yet. Uh, we're spinning up these essentially SVM rollups for them, which allow Solana projects to easily enter their ecosystem. Awesome. Yeah. Isolated fee markets, I think, are one of the most exciting developments, uh, at least for me personally. I, I think that really will be a new standard for, for blockchain as a whole. Um, but I'm curious. So... 
on the Eclipse settlement layer itself, will there be any transactions other than the rollups uh, posting their call data down? Or it, like, I guess uh, what I'm asking is, can somebody come and build an application directly on top of Eclipse itself without building a rollup? Yeah, it's a restricted execution environment. So you know, no, you can't just deploy. Ultra. Yeah, we don't we don't want people using the settlement layer for execution, just because it, it kind of goes against the ethos in many ways. Like the settlement layer should just be good at settlement. And we might even make additional changes to that execution layer in order to bet, uh, better facilitate settlement. Interesting. So one of my hesitations with some of the DA layers like Celestia, for example, is there's really no way to have a trust minimized bridge between Celestia and whatever external ecosystem. So I'm worried about the security of the actual data. So do you think one of the big target markets for you guys is to serve as that settlement layer that can kind of act as the intermediary between these DA layers? Yeah, it, the thing is, like, it's only trust minimized if it's, like, between... So this Eclipse settlement layer is, uh, uses Celestia for DA. So if you have your X, your L3 also using Celestia, now it's trust minimized, assuming you have a light client running for Celestia plus the settlement layer plus your uh, your execution layer. Like, you, you, could, uh, you could make it trust minimized, but I honestly just feel like there's... Like, the trust minimized bridge idea is just so overrated. Like, well, first, it's people dis- disagree on definitions for it. But second, I just don't see the value of it. it the, the user experience for a trust minimized bridge for an optimistic rollup just sucks to wait the challenge period typically. And I just don't think that that's going to be what facilitates interop between uh, between chains in the future. Nice. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, so why don't you think Ethereum L2s kind of use their own paralyzable execution environments today is, for example, like the SVM? Yeah, part of it is uh, I think that it's still very expensive to use Ethereum for DA. So making it parallelized just makes it worse. Now it's like you have far more transaction output or far more blocks being produced. And we have some, right? Like look at Fuel VM. Uh, Fuel was, you know, or it is a layer two on Ethereum. So it's possible. For us, we just found that directly settling on Ethereum was prohibitively expensive. And it's still kind of expensive even for Optimism, for example. Like the fees aren't like zero. That's it's not, it's not reflecting the cost of free block space, for example. So, and I think that, like, if you look at Solana or something, the cost that you're paying basically is reflecting zero, like roughly zero cost block space. The price you're paying is like you're describing, it's just a local fee. If everyone's trying to mint an NFT and there's 10 people who want it and there's only two of them, then the price should go up. That's the only way to, to fairly order those. So I think that those are, that's, that's kind of my thinking. It's just that, you know, the Ethereum L2s, they're early. The most obvious way to uh, to start out is by just forking Geth and do things like mini Geth, make it single threaded. But I think that now we're starting to see more sophisticated rollups pop up. And I'd be surprised if single threaded EVM ends up being the end all be all. Uh, it, it just seems extremely unlikely to me, given so many applications can be facilitated the moment you enable parallelism. Right. And you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, one of the great things here is being able to inherit some of these advancements that get made. Um, Fire Dancer, for example, is there any uh, unlocks that happen for Eclipse given the creation and pub, uh, public publicization of Fire Dancer? Yeah, it's huge for us. Because, I mean, if you look at the Solana L1, uh, not everyone's going to upgrade to Fire Dancer. Whereas for Eclipse, we can upgrade all the sequencers. It's this weird thing where sometimes we benefit from things that ecosystems are doing more than that original ecosystem even benefits. There's a light client being developed on uh, Solana called Tiny Dancer, and we've been chatting with that team, and it could potentially be used for Eclipse too. I'm trying to come up with other good examples, but it, it literally happens all the time where I'm like, that's weird how they did work that's almost better suited for Eclipse, and it makes a lot of sense in a roll-up, and it only kind of makes sense on a layer one. Yeah, no, that that, that makes sense as well. Um, and so when you think about value accrual, like where does that happen in the context of Eclipse? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And the way that we think about our tokenomics is kind of similar to traditional SaaS, but just more crypto native. So it's some kind of like fixed plus variable where the fixed cost maybe is staking to decentralize your sequencer. That's not really a fixed cost. It's more like an opportunity cost. But, you know, you buy some amount of tokens, you you put it up. And then the variable cost is most like, I mean, you definitely have to charge at the settlement layer because you have to compensate people for receiving those fault and validity proofs. So that's like kind of a variable cost where the variable component is the number of blocks produced. And that also seems fair because if someone sets their block time really low, they probably shouldn't be paying as much to us. And you could see a world where we charge a transaction fee. I don't know if that's the right approach because what will happen is you'll cannibalize your biggest customers. 
if you're a game running millions of transactions, you really took off. There's some point where you're like, why am I paying Eclipse so much money just for, you know, the, the benefit of running our transactions? We can do this ourselves and they've kind of, they'll kind of grow, outgrow your ecosystem. So we don't want that to happen. So that's, that's why I think transaction volume maybe isn't the right play. No, that, that's an excellent point because one of my fears about shared sequencers is that they come more of a, like they kind of turn into like a launch pad, right? Because uh, if you create this ecosystem that is bustling with MEV, for example, then that's valuable to internalize. Um, so yeah, I, I, I kind of like your approach of being cognizant of the fact that you can't just essentially tax these larger players out of existence. Yeah, I, I think it's like the good shared sequencers will have to do some kind of revenue sharing because there's no way that Eclipse with our like, let's say we, we want to put like 20 chains on a shared sequencer. Why would we do that if it's just going to be extractive? So I, I think it gives the more chains you have in your ecosystem or your roll up as a service ecosystem, the more leverage you should have, uh, given that you could move all these chains simultaneously and kind of push your weight around. So where does the ordering actually happen for Eclipse chains then, right? Because I'm just thinking for shared sequencers. Like if I was a roll up, would I be able to leverage a shared sequencer and Eclipse? Yeah, right now it's first come first serve and it does in the, the executor and sequencer are basically the same. But in the future, you could separate those components. You basically have a some like quote unquote lazy sequencer or dumb sequencer. It just does the ordering, uh, sends those orderings directly to executors. They execute the block. And then the uh, the result is posted to the settlement layer. The block is posted to some DA layer. It's also theoretical separating these two components. Uh, and yeah, definitely interested to see when it's something concrete or tangible that we can use. In terms of interoperability, how are you thinking about that, Neil? Like, are you? I know you guys have some implementations you're working on with IBC and with a, a project called Hyperlane. But I just, I guess, I feel like the interoperability part of this equation is going to be a little bit more difficult to you, given how modular you guys are in nature. Yeah, in the short run, that was one of the criteria that we'd use to sort verticals or to rank what areas to enter. It's like, what's the need for composability in this vertical? That's why things like a yield aggregator or something, not a great fit for their own rollup. And that's part of why we've been avoiding DeFi. Whereas if you look at gaming, a lot of the transactions are within that same game. They just blow up the chain. They typically hit their own contracts. Let's say they're using third web or something. They can just deploy those contracts to their own chain as well. So that's what we've been seeing for games. And that's why I think it's been really easy to get traction there. Whereas something like, uh, like let's say, small cap NFTs, those guys seriously need to be where everyone else lives because they need to be where the liquidity lives. So, so yeah, that was, that's definitely something we've been thinking about. And that's going to inform our DeFi construction too. We want to be very conscientious of the fact that DeFi's composable nature is what makes it so great. So we want to retain that. Uh, as far as like how we've been approaching it, yeah, you mentioned IBC. Hyperlane. So bridging and basic things like that is, is one simple solution. I think that the shared sequence, not to go back to sequencing, but I think that the shared sequencer could enable a lot of that too, uh, given that they can do those sorts of atomic compositions and maybe you can like a bid to include a block that are, or to include like two transactions necessarily must be executed in some order or something like that. I think, I think there's uh, stuff that can be done around that that can better facilitate cross rollup uh, interoperability. So speaking you know, more into the cosmos, like it almost feels like the idea of like rollups is, is almost like the natural evolution of the Cosmos SDK and just the ability to launch a, a, a rollup as opposed to an app specific chain. Um, how, what's your kind of view on that? Do you like, do you, do you view roll, uh, Eclipse as kind of like that natural evolution of roll, uh, the Cosmos SDK or, or not at all? Yeah, I, I, I feel like there's an inherent tension and that's what's really fun to play with, which is that. I mean, in, in many ways, we are so aligned with the Cosmos ecosystem. We're IBC enabled. We use Celestia, which is a cause, and it, you know, it uses Tendermint, and it's a Cosmos SDK chain with many modifications. Uh, and we align with many Cosmos projects. That's where I came from originally. And a lot of the concepts and inspiration for app specific rollups is, we're definitely indebted to Cosmos for that reason. But rollups are also viewed as an Ethereum concept. Rollups are anchored to Ethereum most of the time. Uh, so it's it's definitely one of those things where I feel in the future, there will be very few reasons to deploy a full layer one blockchain, given that you're only getting downsides. Uh, the the re really big upside is you get to maximally extract value. But when you're initially finding PMF, that's not really where your focus should be anyway. You should get something that people really enjoy using and then focusing on extracting value. It's like when you're a SaaS business, a tiny SaaS startup of like three people, they're trying to charge companies like 50 grand right off the bat. 
when actually they might be better off just charging their cogs or uh, or maybe doing some sort of like get a couple of design partners and maybe charge them just like cost of labor and things like that. Figure out the pricing model later once you define that core ICP and product. So that's that's kind of why I feel like rollups are a great breeding ground for innovation because it makes it so easy to get started at the level of sophistication that a layer one typically was required before. Specifically, uh, back uh, you know, I saw you guys were working with Skip for a little bit just to, on discussions with MEV. Where did those land? And uh, is, we still like, talk with them. We have like a bi weekly with them. <laughs> it's going to become more relevant because now, I mean, this is off the record, but we're doing some. Uh, it's, you can't say anything off the record when it's being recorded and posted, but it, we're doing some stuff related to NFTs, which might have some impacts on the mempool. And th- the reason why the engagement just never really took off and we never really implemented it is one, it's non-trivial to implement because Solana removes the mempool and we ripped the Solana VM uh, out of Solana. So that means that we took Gulfstream with that. We might want to reintroduce a mempool for many reasons, including shared sequencing. But for now, there is no mempool in the Eclipse chains. So that's one reason. The second is that there just wasn't any demand for it from the types of apps that we're targeting. I'm, even for DeFi, I feel like there isn't that much NED, you know? And that's why, I mean, crypto is so funny because it's like, it is it is it's so different from Web2. And now we're having people that are like, hey, maybe we should like try to frame our stuff as a Web2 type of model. So they're like, hey guys, we have like revenue. We're pulling in like, I don't know, like money. And then you ask them how much and maybe it's like a couple, like a couple hundred a day or a few grand a day. And in Web2, you're actually better off just not even saying that because that, that's not good. Like, it, yeah, cash is cool, but only if it's like something that you're ready to actually optimize for and grow really aggressively. But if you're only able to pull in a couple of grand a day, then uh, that's not really the kind of thing to be bragging about unless it's something that's, that's growing really quickly. So that's, that's kind of my view. It's like when there's so little MEV on the chain, especially for games, like that's not our games are not a lot of them are not heavily financialized at all. I think none of them are really like, none of them are like play to earn or anything. These are just games that are fully on chain, first person shooters, like crazy things like that. Uh, they're they're not really places where you'd capture MEV anyway. So we never we never implemented it. In terms of like competing with Ethereum, because I feel like it's kind of fair to say that you are in a way, given that you know Ethereum is going for this roll up centric settlement layer for for the world. So. How would you respond to um, just the fact that Ethereum has such a first mover advantage in terms of decentralization and security? Like how will Eclipse as a settlement layer for rollups eventually get to that point? So I view it as complementary because Ethereum does multiple functions right now. That's what's so confusing about it. Not only is it acting as a settlement layer, it's also doing consensus and DA, which it'll it'll do even more of after, you know, donk sharding and all that. Uh, And it does execution of smart contracts natively on the L1. So our point is just that we actually don't think it should be doing all that. And Ethereum has a great validator t- set. There's tons of security backing it. It should be a consensus and DA layer. And uh, that's pretty much how we use it when we use Eigen DA. And that's why we're really excited about what Shroom is building because it's very in line with how we want to use Ethereum. And that's that's where we see the complementary intersection. As far as why I pick uh, like a dedicated settlement layer, over Ethereum as a settlement layer is really just because there's some operations that are so expensive, basically prohibitively expensive to settle on the ETH L1. I think someone trying to settle the Solana VM on the ETH L1 is going to go through a lot of difficulty. They're going to experience the same like challenges that we face and ultimately, uh, which led us to building our own sovereign settlement layer. So I'm curious to hear more about what people are building. Um, you've mentioned gaming a few times. That seems like a no brainer application, but what else is there? Is like consumer applications another big one I would imagine? So the way that I've been thinking about it, so um, just to answer the question directly, immediately, uh, physical infrastructure has been really huge for us. So React, uh, it's now going to be rebranded to Daylight. These guys install like a meter in everyone's house. They can track their power consumption. They track your solar panel generation, your battery recharging. They take all this enormous amount of data and post it on chain. Uh, And then at this point, they haven't made it public yet. So I don't know if they're going to end up encrypting it or what the plan is, but there's just so many interesting things you can do once you have that data. You can optimize the power in someone's house. You're like, all right, we should turn on the thermostat at this time. Let's um, recharge the battery here, discharge it at this point. And it's especially interesting for me just because I used to be a quant and doing power. So I just find it very cool. Uh, So that's that's an example. There's Wave who's doing uh, like kind of like consumer data on chain. Uh, and you can do the GDPR enforcement on chain too. They have some huge partnerships coming. 
wind who does decentralized proxies. So we have a bunch of, bunch of physical infrastructure stuff. Uh, and then we have rollups for layer ones. So that's another place where we have really obvious PMF, where if you try to ask an L1, do you guys want to support SVM or other execution layers and bring these apps to your ecosystem? It's the easiest sell. Uh, folks like BNB chain have been reaching out and we have a few other exchanges like OKC, some of these other, we haven't announced all these, so uh, I don't want to like go down the, the laundry list, but, uh, but yeah, a lot of roll ups appreciate having different exec or a lot of layer ones appreciate different execution layers. So that's been the categories that we've done so far. And now we're testing out these early areas where it's not as obvious how a roll up fits in. You can't give them a vanilla roll up, but this is cases like NFTs, DeFi. Like what's the right specific offering that's tailored to those verticals? What's the template? Again, uh, in the same way that for gaming, a template often is like centralized DA, don't charge the native token and gas, instead charge like USDC or make it gasless uh, and EVM. That's that's what I'd consider a template. What does that look like for DeFi? And probably it wouldn't, maybe it'd be somewhere where a roll up where just the liquidity, there's just all sorts of like different constructions you can do basically. So we're still iterating through those. We have a few different constructions that we're testing out with our design partners. And I think once we get one that's that's really compelling to folks, then I'd want to scale that too. So speaking of DeFi, you guys announced a pretty interesting partnership or alignment with uh, Catalyst the, to kind of be that liquidity layer. Can you speak to that a bit? Yeah. Uh, so Jim and I have just like chatted a bit on it. I'm excited to see where that goes because it's, it's a real problem. Like having liquidity fragmentation across rollups is going to be, I mean, assuming that we have like, let's say a thousand rollups by the end of next year, where does, where should the liquidity live? Should it live on the settlement layer? doesn't really seem quite right because like we were talking about, the settlement layer should be restricted in its function and execution. So yeah, I, I could see some use case for a primitive like catalyst. And it, it, I mean, it's just hard to predict where the liquidity is going to live. And it's one of those things that I, I wouldn't make any bets on it because I think with uh, shared sequencing, there's uh, maybe it doesn't matter. There, it, It's just kind of confusing to see uh, what, where that will end up. But in the short run, I think uh, shared, shared liquidity is like a really obvious one. Are you at all worried, Neil? Like how is the consumer actually going to get to the rollups that are settling to Eclipse? Like, because I'm thinking about it through my head. Like I think... Cosmos has been hard to get to since day one and, and until the sex integrations with like Osmosis and, and Adam itself. And then, um, yeah, I guess it took forever for a lot of decentralized exchanges to integrate with Arbitrum and Optimism. So are you at all worried about liquidity being able to get to these rollups? Yeah, it's like a bridging interoperability question, right? Like luckily, a lot of the infrastructure can just be used out of the box, meaning wallets, uh, EVM wallets are basically built to be multi-chain. So the question is just how do you get their money there tactically? In some cases, they don't even need money, right? Some of these roll-ups, they're gasless, or it's the chain themselves that's subsidizing the gas. So those cases are easy. And that's especially true in the case of games. Uh, for cases where they seriously do need money, uh, yeah, we're, I'm excited to see where Hyperlink goes in terms of they have some on-ramp, off-ramp that they're developing, a lot of other on-ramp, on uh, off-ramps that we're working with. So yeah, de definitely want to make it really easy for li liquidity to get there. If we're... Uh, <laughs> like looking at some of the specific projects we're working on, one of those NFT projects I was talking about, natively in the Mint side, the first step it asks you to do is bridge some money over. Uh, and then you you wait there, you actually do the minting, and then you can bridge it back for easily. So this might be something that's built directly into the front end of applications. This is kind of going back to something we talked about earlier in the conversation. But if you're looking to be a settlement layer for a lot of different um, types of virtual machines that support different types of um, programming languages. How does it actually work to get that from, you know, high level source code in a smart contract down to byte code? Like, what does that process actually look like? And does that mean that there's going to be need to be additional developer tooling built out in order to copy and paste a Uniswap onto like an Arbitrum deployment that settles to Eclipse? Yeah. So, so just just to reiterate, though, we wouldn't support like an Arbitrum chain on Eclipse. It has to be an Eclipse execution chain. Just, just to um, rephrase that, but uh, yeah, as far as how, uh, like whether there's additional scaffolding needed, we wanted to keep the original bytecode intact. So we didn't want to say like, okay, you actually have to compile to some other, you compile to EVM and it goes to something else. Instead, we natively interpret that EVM bytecode. We can also natively interpret BPF bytecode. So that means that you get to use all the same tooling. And, and that matters because like, for example, um, like Seahorse Lang, which is the Python thing for Solana, if we if we tried to cut things off and let's say the Rust step, or if, if we basically tried to compile it in a different way, then I'm concerned that we would lose the backwards compatibility with all that tooling. 
So we, we want to let people use their tooling as is, and then we just may figure out how to take that bytecode in and make it work. Awesome. Well, Neil, it's been great having you on. I'd love to give you a chance to kind of give some like a, some closing statements here and anything you want to leave the audience with as well as where to find you and learn more about Eclipse. Yeah, definitely. So if you're a game really pushing the frontiers of uh, what's possible on crypto, if you're a physical infrastructure network, if you're an L1 who wants a roll up, if you're even a DeFi protocol who thinks that maybe a roll up could solve a problem that you're facing or some other vertical, reach out to us. Uh, Twitter is really great. It's Eclipse FND on Twitter. It's not Eclipse FDN. That's the bane of my existence. Uh, it's Eclipse FND. Or you could uh, DM me directly. It's Neil Salami, N-E-E-L Salami, like the meat. And that's my Twitter handle. And uh, and yeah, definitely follow, follow us on Twitter because that's where we post most of our updates and we have ex- some exciting stuff uh, coming up. Fantastic. And we'll put all those links in the description of this pod as well. Uh, and I will definitely say, get it, get it, be sure to check out the uh, Eclipse blog post. I got some really great information on there. But Neil, it's been great speaking with you today. Cheers. Thank you.